Welcome to the Café Culture podcast, a season of discussions on culture, politics, philosophy and science. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, Esther. And um, uh, like Esther explained, uh, there was um, some... <laughs> Uh, there, there was a title that went out about me that I was, I was going to talk about the role of um, art and physics in cosmology, which I was rather alarmed about when somebody came up to me and asked me about my knowledge of um, physics. Um, and so the, the, the actual title that was given um, was uh, Negative Capability, Photography and Fundamental Science. Um, so... If anybody's still labouring under the misapprehension that I am going to talk about physics um, and that was what they came to hear, I really won't be offended if you walk out <laughs> now. Please, please do, I don't want to be done under the Trades Descriptions Act. Okay, I suppose one of the first things to say is that I'm a practising artist and actually to ask an artist to do a talk without images is sort of tantamount to torture because we are all habituated into talking as, whoops, as, as slides come up and we can, um, if we stray off the path, we can kind of be brought back by the, um, the works that we're actually seeing. But on a more sort of serious level, I think as a, as a visual artist, you always have a sense that what, what you're showing, the way you're communicating through visual means is always going to say more, it's always going to be more articulate than we would be standing here imparting information or anecdotes. So um, I'm sorry that you're, I'm going to be talking a lot about visualization about photography and I'm not allowed to show you any images so you're going to have to just sort of bear with me. I have got a couple of props here because I had a word with um, somebody who has presented before, um, David Elliott, who is a geneticist and he said he used a piece of Lego to talk which I thought was a really intelligent thing because not only have you got a bit of a kind of uh, visual metaphor here to talk about genetics but you've also got something to kind of fiddle with which um, was probably quite a kind of comfort in a way but anyway we will um, progress with it without our images and, and I may or may not make recourse to my to my props here. Um, so Esther gave a, a kind of very short um, potted history of, um, of my education. So probably the best place to start is to just put a little bit more flesh on the bones of that. Um, my original degree was in sculpture. Um, and, that, and that root, um, that mother tongue, if you like, of object making and of dealing with actual three-dimensional space as opposed to cosmological space, um, is an, a very important route to me because although my work has been ostensibly photographic for the last 20 years or so, um, I still very much think about the works that I make as objects. So their presence in the kind of architectural space that they occupy and their scale in relation to us um, is, is very important. So, so that, that, that route is, is still important. Um, and then I went on to, after a couple of years, I did a postgraduate course at the Slade um, School of Fine Art in London, and um, I was working more um, photographically by that point, and also doing quite a bit of film work, which I hadn't done since, but I've come back to just recently. Um, and then uh, I was in London for probably the next 15 years and I was uh, working um, uh, often in residency situations where I would be going and spending um, kind of concentrated periods of time uh, at various places in this country and abroad. So I spent um, a period of six months working in Rome, which was a very um, seminal experience for me. Um, but I also spent some time working up here in Berwick uh, when I did the Berwick Gymnasium Fellowship. And I mention that because, sadly, the Gymnasium Fellowship isn't running anymore, but I think it ran for several years, and it was a really important um, catalyst for bringing um, artists from outside of the region and from other countries as well here and um, I think it's been responsible for a lot of people moving here certainly it was for me eventually uh, so so I was at Berwick um, between 1999 and 2000 
And when I was there, I was expecting my first child, so I was getting bigger and bigger as I was doing that residency. I went back to London, um, had her, and then in 2003, I um, moved up to this region permanently with my partner and our then two children. So I've been connected with Northumbria University really since that time, um, and I hope contributing to the dynamic of, of fine art um, that goes on there, and also um, to the uh, relationship that we've now got, Northumbria University's got with Baltic, um, that was a partnership that was formed a couple of years ago. So one, one of the um, main sort of uh, things that's happening through that partnership is various different events, and um, I think some people I've spoken to tonight already um, came to the event we did for the British Science Festival in September, which was called Extraordinary Renditions. <laughs> Esther thought it was called Brief Encounters. I don't know. I don't know how. It was called Extraordinary Renditions, and the um, subtitle was The Cultural Negotiation of Science. And within that, it was it was a five day exhibition, so it was it was quite a short exhibition, just for when the um, science festival was on, but we also had this symposium and networking day. And one of the things we were trying to do was to um, take advantage of the fact that there are several artists, staff members, academics, and researchers working at Northumbria who are really looking across the spectrum of science from um, biomedical science, um, Christine Borland, who I think has come to speak um, with you before, who's looking at um, biomedical science, but particularly anatomy and um, public perceptions of death. Uh, and then Chris Dorset, who's been working with geneticists for several years, um, has gone ongoing collaborations. Um, and then we brought other scientists who were, uh, sorry, other artists who had been working with scientists in the spheres of um, environmental science, technological science, and then there was my interest in fundamental science. And one of the things that we were really trying to um, dispel, really, was uh, a kind of myth that I think has often surrounded collaboration between artists and scientists, where art is seen as the kind of illustrator of science, um, where um, the art kind of gives the public a kind of uh, uh, set, a, a way of looking at science which is more accessible, which is kind of laudable in itself. But um, what, what we were trying to kind of dig deeper with really was that idea that actually the art can produce knowledge in itself. And really these kind of long-term or short-term collaborations can produce something new for the scientists as well as the artists, new ways of kind of looking um, at, at what's going on and a new knowledge that can only come from that relationship between those two fields. So, um, yeah, that idea of kind of dispelling the myth as, uh, as art as a kind of an illustrative device for science was really important. And also that what the public came to see at Baltic was practice-based research, which is what we call <laughs> making art now. Um, that is the language that we, that, that we are, are kind of forced to use, really, in terms of funding bids, etc. So people were coming along and they could engage with work that had been made in various different um, forms and collaborations with artists. So that's, that's sort of putting, putting, as I say, a bit more flesh on the bones of, 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 of kind of where I've come from and, and how I sort of happen to be here. Um, so I think maybe the other thing to look at um, as well is uh, that idea of negative capability that I've used in the title of the talk. Um, as some of you may well know, um, negative capability uh, is actually a phrase that was used and coined by the romantic poet John Keats. And he used it not, not in a poem, but he used it when he wrote in a letter to his brother in 1817, I think it was. And he was talking about um, this desirable state of being in what he called doubts and uncertainties. And he recognized this as 
um, a state that was that was really necessary for creativity. And, it, and it's interesting, you know, when you think about the backdrop against which he was making this claim, you know, the backdrop of, of the Enlightenment where science was kind of opening up the universe and it was seen as a very um, uh, clear and, and the desire was for it to be kind of a clockwork universe that it was revealed to people and that empirical knowledge was um, the kind of order of the day. So I think, you know, Keats making this stance for the importance of doubt um, was very interesting at that juncture. But I think for me, it's, um, it was a phrase that I came across um, a long time ago when I was doing my undergraduate thesis in the mid-1980s. And um, I, was, I was writing my thesis about ideas of doubt and about um, ideas of absence. And I was wrestling with these ideas. And um, I had a, um, a, a really amazing guy who was my supervisor at that point and um, he saw that I was kind of struggling with these ideas and he took me and he marched me off to the library and he marched me to the poetry section and he got out this book of Keats and he pointed to this and he said there you go negative capability that's what you mean isn't it and um, and of course it was and um, and I suppose nowadays he would have googled it or something which would would be not half so great as being hauled off to the to the poetry section of the library but <clears throat> the point was that that has kind of stayed with me and kind of lain in the background really as an idea. But because of the, um, the path my work's taken over the last couple of years, starting to talk to scientists and particularly um, fundamental scientists, the, this, this idea of neg negative capability has kind of come back to the fore for me. Um, but I think the other thing to say about it is that um, I also use it in a very literal sense. I'm really interested in what a photograph is capable of. Um, that idea of negative capabilities, what are its limits? Um, because I think the failure of photography, what it can't do is, is almost as interesting as what it can do. Um, and, and I mean that in a really kind of positive way. And sometimes I get in hot water when I go and talk to people on photography courses because they feel that I'm somehow, you know, not sort of sticking up for the cause and, and you know, the, the things that photography can do. But, but those, those limits, those points where photography fail, I think, um, are very interesting. And um, what I'm going to do, I'm going, I'm going to show you an image, so I'm, I'm contravening the rules. Um, but I did, I did read in your manifesto that you were allowed to use books. Yes. <laughs> so I'm not going to read from a book, but I'm going to show you an image because I think, I think this is quite a good illustration of um, what I'm trying to talk about. And I think you'll be able to see it at the back. Okay. So this is an image. It's called the ballroom. Um, and for anybody who did go to the, uh, the symposium at Baltic, I've, forgive me because I did talk about this image quite a lot. Um, that looked like Ben Nicholson's all black. It is all black. <laughs> but it's not Ben Nicholson. No, it's not Ben Nicholson. It was taken with this camera. So it really is an image, I promise you. And it, it was actually the first image that I took when I moved up here 10 years ago. Um, and it's called the ballroom. And I uh, learnt about this space called the ballroom. Um, from somebody I was talking to and it's actually a, a, a kind of cavernous room in a disused lead mine up near Nent Head. Okay, and it's not, it's not the mines where um, you can go in as a tourist but you can go if you've got somebody who's willing to take you there. So I managed to find um, an artist, Alan Smith, who took me to the ballroom. So we spent a few hours kind of crouching, walking, crawling through the bits where the tunnels had collapsed and after a couple of hours we came into this um, this space which was called the ballroom because apparently at some point they did actually have some form of entertainment down there. So the image that I took was this is what the camera saw. So it was exposed to that space. And in some sense, people could look at this and think that it was a kind of a conceptual photograph. But it's not. It's, you know, it is a scan of the negative. Um, and I think, like I say, I'm interested in, in the kind of failure of 
photography. But what you get when you, when you try and approach an image like this is you have to start thinking about what a photograph does actually do. It records space and time and place. And when all those things are kind of withdrawn, you're kind of thrown back onto um, understanding it as, as a kind of visual phenomena just there in front of you. So this work was, was taken 10 years ago, but it wasn't made until I showed it at Baltic in September. And so it's, it's about 1, one metre 20 square, so three foot square. And um, it's one of the difficult, most difficult works I've ever made. I work with a printer who, um, is, his name's Jack Lowe, he works in Newcastle, but he's a master printer. Um, and uh, Jack almost gave up on this, and he's never given up on an image, ever. And we only managed to print it in the end by him using his network of experts all around the world. And eventually, I think, I think a, a technician in Barcelona gave him some um, settings for his printer so he could make this without having any lines on it. So there was no lines from the print head, there was no lines from the print bed. Um, so, so this work is made, it was framed, and it has museum glass, which gives it this very kind of peculiar green tint. And so a lot of people thought it was a blank plasma screen, and they were standing there waiting for the image to start coming up. So it sort of really played with our kind of notion of what a photograph is, um, and then people read the label and understood it was an actual pigment print, it was a still image. But also it forces us to kind of imaginatively engage with what that space is. That that space is there existing all the time that we are standing um, looking at this photograph. So those, those ideas of kind of limits and capabilities um, I find enormously compelling. And it wasn't the first image that I had taken in an underground space, um, and I guess what, that was one of the other reasons why I was interested in it when I heard about it, because I had been photographing um, in several different locations underground, and the first set of images I took was in the, um, when I was in Rome, and I worked in the early Christian catacombs taking images. And when I was there, I was using these cameras to photograph. So even more perverse, photographing there. There were lights there in the catacombs, though. Um, but I was using these pinhole cameras, so they um, were taking a long time to expose, probably about three hours to expose an image on there. So again, within that, I was interested in... Um, this idea that actually underground in the catacombs, it was almost like you were photographing something that was already still, because the um, environment there is so stable. Um, they they put these lights in. Interestingly, these kind of they just whacked in these kind of very utilitarian um, emergency lights. But apart from that, you know, these these um, spaces had been in that state for hundreds of years. They were absolutely stable. They say the same temperature, summer and winter, and there is absolutely no sound. Um, so when I was waiting for the um, images to expose, at one point I was I was making some notes, and I thought that there was a kind of an avalanche starting somewhere in the distance. But all it was was my leather jacket creaking. You know, so it's sort of playing tricks on you. Anyway, so um, so these photographs that I started to take in different underground locations accrued into um, a, a, a show that toured nationally, and it launched at Baltic in 2009. And what happened was that when that exhibition toured, it went down to Bradford, and they asked me to... They wanted to commission a new set of works. They actually wanted me to take some images underneath um, the culverted rivers in, in Bradford. And I, I didn't want to do that because it sort of, missed, sort of misconstrued um, the way that I was thinking about the spaces that I was um, photographing in. But the place that I had been trying to gain access for about a year prior to that was on the North Yorkshire coast. 
And if anybody is in the room who is interested in cosmology or fundamental science, you probably all know that there's an underground laboratory there at, at Bowlby. So I've been trying to gain access um, to that uh, place, both to the mine itself, but also to the laboratory. And um, luckily, I managed to do so. So there were some images that um, joined that exhibition of, um, of underground work, subterranea, that were taken from Bulby Mine. And really, that was my beginning of my um, relationship talking to cosmologists, to astrophysicists, um, and to um, theoretical physicists, because the experience of going down there was, was quite extraordinary. I mean, the, the mine itself is it's a potash mine, um, and it's the deepest working mine in this country. So the shaft itself is about over, or just over a kilometre deep. But then the mine itself goes out for, I think, about seven, seven miles out underneath the sea. So the experience of being there, which was one of the things that interested me about the other underground sites that I'd been working, was this extraordinary kind of phenomenological experience, actually, of being underground, of being in these spaces. So again, I was thinking very much about how, how photography can... Um, can uh, can operate in those kind of environments, um, how, how those kind of phenomenological experiences can be manifest in a different way, because patently we can't kind of communicate what it is to be underground like that, or to be in a space, or to be seven miles out underneath the sea. So um, the, uh, the, the way that the photograph operates, both in a kind of an imaginative and a conceptual and a sort of physical way as an image in a gallery space or wherever it's shown is um, something that you really have to sort of try and try and get your head around how that how that's going to work but anyway so I, I, I got access to the to the underground laboratory there and um, again a sort of an extraordinary experience because uh, it, it's a sort of five million pound laboratory that they've got there which you would imagine as being incredibly high tech and in some senses it is um, you know the the, uh, the the progression of um, the clothes that you have to change into, dry showers that you have to have to move from the actual mine environment into the um, laboratory environment is quite extraordinary. Um, so you end up, you know, dressed like somebody who is working where they make microchips or, or something. So you're completely kind of cleaned up. But and and the experiments they have going on there. Um, are also extraordinary. They've got some incredible high-tech equipment. And the main thing that they're looking for at Bowlby is um, what they call weakly interacting massive particles, um, which are called WIMPs. And that's the other attractive thing about fundamental science is all their uh, acronyms. Um, but, I mean, they've got several different experiments going on there, but that, that's one of their, their kind of main experiments. That's what they've been looking for, for for 30 years or more down there. So before they had this £5 million laboratory, the people were working in a garden shed, which was in the mine, um, which is quite extraordinary because the temperatures there are extreme. You know, you have to, you have to wear... Um, belts of water around your waist so that you don't dehydrate um, and so they had no air conditioning in a shed <clears throat> so that idea that they're there waiting for these weakly interactive massive particles um, and it's it's a passive process unlike CERN where you know they're whacking the particles around the 27 kilometers of the collider um, at Bowlby, they have um, experiments where they use what they call a target um, uh, uh, solution. And so they essentially have a great big tank of liquid xenon, and they're, um, they're looking for these particles to go through it. And, and they're underground because that's the quietest place, because above ground there's too much going on in terms of kind of radiation. And... There's about five different places around the world um, that are engaged 
in looking for these same particles. So as one place um, creates a kind of a bigger, more sensitive um, uh, experiment, then the next place tries to raise the money to do theirs and to do theirs. So what, what, what has happened is that the theoretical physicists have conjectured that if these particles do exist, they will be in a certain place on this, on this graph. Um, and, and as the machines get more, or as experiments get more and more sensitive, the, this graph is, is, is closing down and closing down. They call it closing the envelope. And of course the question that you ask is what happens when you get to the bottom of the envelope and it's closed and they haven't found the particles. And, and I asked this um, of one of the um, astrophysicists there and they said, then we rethink gravity. <laughs> Which, you know, so, you know, they're dealing with things on that kind of scale and, and magnitude. But I think one of the other things that interests me was um, the, uh, the idea of faith that goes on, not a religious faith, although a lot of, a lot of um, kind of fundamental scientists are religious, funnily enough, but a kind of an investment in, um, uh, you know, finding something that's there. And a lot of, you know, the people that you spoke to at CERN before they did actually say that the boson, Higgs boson had been found, they said it would be as interesting if it wasn't found, which is also something that I think is, you know, hard for the public at large to kind of get their head around. How how a negative could actually be more exciting than actually finding something. So, the path that I've been on subsequent to Bowlby has been really trying to open up as many situations as possible, where I build trust with people who are working in the in the spaces and the laboratories where fundamental science goes on and to allow me to be there and film and take photographs and to try and start thinking about some of these parallels that there are in in my field and in their fields um, so for example when I went to CERN um, I was really struck by the idea of collective intelligence, because sometimes it's the differences between the fields. Um, and when uh, you spoke to people there, you realised that, that none of them, even the Nobel Prize winners, none of them have a sense of everything that's going on. Everybody only has a sense of probably an absolute fraction of what's there, you know, be it they theoretical or um, experimental physicists or phenomenologists that kind of make the link between the two. Everybody is kind of dealing with this, this kind of small part of this kind of massive thing that's going on. And, and this, you know, huge act of faith that, that has been um, supported and invested in since the 1950s, actually, at CERN. So, so that idea of collective intelligence, how that might work in other spheres, um, also, that idea of curiosity-driven research, why you would ask to do something, why you would pursue something that um, not is just expensive, but, you know, creates these investments of whole, whole careers, um, I think is, is, is really kind of very interesting. So, um, so, yeah, I've been building these relationships with CERN, with several of the um, departments at um, Durham, um, so connected to the um, Ogden Centre of um, Physics there at Durham. And, and really what, as I say, I've been doing is, is starting to spend time, starting to make photographs. So some of that work, and especially the film work that I've been doing very recently, was shown um, in this cultural negotiation of science that was um, there in September. So I think, should we, should we stop there and may, maybe we can have some questions um, talking about maybe some, some of those ideas that are kind of raised by the notion of trying to, trying to, trying to, um, trying to work visually with fields that are almost impossible to imagine or depict visually. Cafe Culture North East is supported by Newcastle University, Peel's and the British Science Association.
We're also supported by Ginger's Cafe in Dunn City, who host the events.